My disclosures, I have no conflicts related to this uh, presentation. I received no funding from pharma or from industry for uh, this presentation or any of my uh, education work. And all the content is essentially developed by myself. So in order to understand the management of heart failure, we need to understand a little bit about the pertinent pathophysiology of what happens to the patient who goes into heart failure. If we understand the basic pathophysiology, then it will become very clear where the therapeutic targets are and which medications are going to be effective. So going back many, many years to the Frank Starling law, taking you back to your medical school days, and you know that there is a relationship between left ventricular and diastolic volume or pressure and the stroke volume. And in the normal situation, as the left ventricular volume increases or pressure, then the stroke volume increases. But when you have a systolic dysfunction of the heart, the curve is shifted downwards and to the right. And therefore, you can have a fair amount of volume in the left ventricle at end diastole. The stroke volume is not that significantly increased. But if the curve is shifted to the left, where there is increased contractility or a medication increases the contractility, then the stroke volume rises with only mild changes in left ventricular volume. So Frank Starling understood this uh, concept that there was a relationship between the left ventricular volume uh, or pressure and stroke volume. And they equated the left ventricular and diastolic volume and the pressure as being essentially the same. Well, over the years, we have now learned that that is not the case. There is a very complex relationship between diastolic volume and diastolic pressure. In the normal situation, which is what Frank Starling were trying to explain to us, was that as the left ventricular diastolic volume increases, there is an increase in pressure, increase in pressure, which is somewhat proportional. So that's a pressure volume relationship. But when you have systolic heart failure, then that pressure volume relationship has shifted way to the right and it takes a large amount of left ventricular volume before the pressure goes up. And that's a mechanism where the left ventricle is dilated. Whereas if you have a situation of diastolic heart failure, what we call heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, then the pressure rises very easily and quickly with minor changes in volume. So the left ventricle may not be dilated and often is not dilated, but the left ventricular and diastolic pressure is significantly elevated. So this understanding of pressure volume is extremely important if the patient has systolic heart failure or if the patient has diastolic heart failure. All right, what else happens in, in heart failure? There is a activation of the neurohumeral system. And we used to know that there was a activation of the sympathetic nervous system and uh, the activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And what we have learned recently is that there is a third uh, humoral system which is the naturetic peptide system, which also is, is, is abnormal in the situation of heart failure. So we all understand the sympathetic nervous system activation with the release of epinephrine, norepinephrine, and the alpha, beta, one, and two receptors are stimulated, leading to vasoconstriction, increased um, RAS uh, activity, vasopressin heart rate goes up, contractility goes up. So there is an increase in afterload hemodynamically as the ventricle is trying to pump, the, there is increased peripheral vascular resistance. Activation of the RAS system um, is where the angiotensin II is produced from angiotensin I, and angiotensin II works on the AT1 receptor and induces vasoconstriction, raises the blood pressure, again, increases the sympathetic tone and releases aldosterone, which is a very harmful substance leading to salt and water retention. 
So you have fluid overload, so there is increase in preload, and you have also vasoconstriction, so there is increase in afterload, and, and therefore there is uh, resistance to ejection of blood. So this, this is detrimental, and so is sympathetic nervous system stimulation detrimental. What we have in our body is a counterbalancing system. And a counterbalancing system is the release of naturetic peptides, you know, the BNP, the uh, ANP, and, and C-type NP. These are the naturetic peptides, and they are a counterbalancing uh, system to the RAS system. So they do exactly what the RAS system does, uh, does not do. So they, they are opposite to each other. So the naturetic peptides bring vasodilatation, naturases, release the extra fluid and uh, decrease aldosterone production, essentially the opposite of the RAS system. The problem in heart failure is that this counterbalancing system is also uh, not functioning the right way and it is essentially attenuated because of the increase in what is called neprolysin. So neprolysin breaks down these naturetic peptides and therefore attenuates or decreases the positive action of the naturetic peptides. So you have you know, attenuation of the good system in heart failure, you have augmentation of the bad RAS system and augmentation of the detrimental sympathetic nervous system. So it is a, a, a complex phenomenon that occurs in the patient with, uh, with heart failure. So if there is systolic heart failure, you have decrease in contractility and that heart failure we now term heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But there could be diastolic dysfunction where the ventricle is stiff and the pressure volume relationship that I explained to you a few minutes ago comes into play and you have a situation where the stroke volume is low because the ventricle has filled with much less volume because it is stiff and it is not relaxing properly. So there is less end diastolic volume and the stroke volume is low. And this is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And it activates the neurohumeral system. As I explained to you, there are three systems that are activated and the hemodynamic consequences of that are an increase in afterload, which decreases cardiac output further, poor organ perfusion, and the patient has symptoms of exercise intolerance and uh, fatigue and um, you know, uh, feeling of inadequate uh, ability to do, do his uh, activity. On the other hand, there is congestion because of increase in preload, leads to left atrial dilatation. But in the case of diastolic heart failure, the left ventricle is not enlarged. It is usually of normal size. So those are the consequences. So when we look at the pathophysiology in heart failure, we have the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. We have the activation of the RAS system and the release of aldosterone. So we have excess aldosterone, the mineral corticoid receptors are activated with the aldosterone. The hemodynamic consequence is an increase in afterload and preload leading to poor exercise tolerance and congestion and edema. And the sympathetic nervous system activates the heart rate and causes arrhythmias and the new neurohumeral system that we have learned about in the last few years is about the neprolysin being activated in heart failure, which breaks down the naturetic peptides and attenuates the good action of the naturetic peptides. So once we understand that, that there is a decrease in contractility with uh, uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and both have congestion, the preserved and the reduced ejection fraction, heart failure, both have con congestion. So our therapy can now be guided at these therapeutic targets, which are abnormal in the patient with uh, heart failure. So we are going to now run through the evidence of various therapies used in heart failure over the years and see if they have evidence to show that decreased morbidity and mortality
in a significant manner. And if they decrease mortality, we will put them into the basket of being lifesavers. So we are now going to see which therapies are lifesavers. So we start with the Joxon in, in 1785 uh, with withering notice that the foxglove was uh, beneficial in people with uh, dropsy, which I believe was heart failure at that time. But in 1930, the joxin was purified from the, the joxin uh, plant, and uh, we became began to use the joxin as a tablet in the uh, management of heart failure. And what the joxin does is, in the patient who has reduced contractility, it moves the Frank Starling curve back to the left and upwards by improving contractility and increasing stroke volume. So it improves cardiac output and improves contractility. It was not until 1997 that we had the first randomized clinical trial done to see if digoxin is actually beneficial in heart failure. And in that so-called DID study, the, there was really no difference in mortality between those patients receiving digoxin and those who were on placebo. However, the rate of hospitalization was improved and therefore digoxin decreased the symptoms and improved the patient's quality of life and there was less hospital admin, uh, ad admissions for people who were on digoxin. But the problem is that when this data was evaluated further, um, there was this evidence that as you look at the patient's digoxin level, and we are looking at levels within the therapeutic range. We're not talking about digoxin toxicity. We're talking about digoxin in the therapeutic range. And you notice that as the digoxin level was higher within the therapeutic range, mortality in women and in men both started to go up. So actually patients were dying more on digoxin than they were on placebo. And the same goes for mortality and hospitalization was worsening as the digoxin level was in the upper half of the therapeutic range. So we got quite worried about the use of digoxin as being a drug that may improve contractility and symptoms, but actually was increasing mortality. And this is the final nail in the coffin of the joxin. And this is the meta-analysis done by VAMOS. And this meta-analysis looked at randomized control trials in atrial fibrillation and in congestive heart failure. And they looked at the mortality of these patients. And in the group of patients with atrial fibrillation who received the joxin to control the rate, the mortality of those patients was higher, significantly higher than those who are receiving placebo. And in the congestive heart failure group as well, the mortality of patients receiving digoxin was higher. And that's when we realized that it is best not to use digoxin in heart failure. Diuretics started in 1919. A medical student was injecting these mercurial uh, injections into uh, patients with syphilis in Vienna, and the medical student noticed that these patients were rushing to the bathroom all the time and were having a diuresis. And that started the era of the mercurial diuretics. And then we went on to the thiazides in the 1950s. And it was not until the end of the 1950s that the loop diuretics were, were developed. And the furosemide is the common one that we use most of the time. And we still use the loop diuretics to this day, and they are most helpful in situations where there is acute heart failure, decompensation, and pulmonary congestion. And in pulmonary edema, the use of loop diuretics is, is extremely crucial and improves the outcome of the patient by clearing the edema from the lungs. So they have a role in the acute setting, and they have a role in the chronic setting. But in the chronic setting, it is very important to be careful with the use of, uh, of um, loop diuretics. And I go back to the Frank Starling curve, and you will see that as you decrease left ventricular volume, you can bring down the stroke volume. So if you 
deplete the fluid more than is necessary uh, and you make the patient hypo, hypovolemic, you're going to drop the forward cardiac output and you're going to have the patient getting more fatigue, weakness, lightheadedness, dizzy. And in that situation, you may not be able to use the full doses of the other life-saving medications because of the problem created by the loop diuretic. So I have found over the years that it is always best in the chronic setting to have the patient be a little wet rather than too dry uh, in the management of heart failure. The other end of the spectrum with loop diuretics is that the patient has severe congestive heart failure and it is very difficult to clear the, uh, the fluid overload, particularly if there is renal dysfunction. And then you need much higher doses of the, um, the diuretic. And additionally, you could use combination of metalazone and a loop diuretic to get the diuresis going, but you have to be extremely careful about electrolyte and magnesium uh, 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 abnormalities. All right, so moving on into the 1980s, uh, we now begin to uh, try to address the situation of the afterload and the preload, which was the hemodynamic problem. So we said, okay, well, let's approach the hemodynamic problem with a vasodilator. Let's do arteriolar dilatation and let's do venous dilatation with hydralazine and nitrates. And that started the era of the VHEF studies using hydralazine and nitrates in patients with systolic heart failure. And the big trial, uh, was the VHEF1, which showed that patients who received isodil and hydralazine had a much better survival <clears throat> than patients who were on placebo or prazosin. So we show now the benefit of hydralazine and nitrates. But when this study was further analyzed, we realized that in white patients, the there was no significant benefit with hydralazine and, uh, and uh, nitrates. And the mortality curves were essentially the same in, um, in um, both cases. Whereas in black patients, there was a significant benefit of using hydralazine and uh, nitrates in the patients who were, had heart failure. So it became clear that there was a racial uh, response that was different in black patients versus white patients. So the VF2 trial was done in the 19, early 1990s. And by this time, ACE inhibitors were already in, in use. And so we could not test it against placebo. So isodyl hydralazine was tested against enalapril and ACE inhibitor, and it was inferior to the ACE inhibitor. The ACE inhibitors were superior in, in, in decreasing mortality than isodyl hydralazine combination. But again, if you look at the racial differences in white patients, there was no question that the ACE inhibitor was far more effective and hydralazine nitrate combination was not effective in white patients and the mortality was higher. But in black patients, the hydralazine nitrate combination was just as effective in, decrease in, 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 in improving survival uh, compared to the ACE inhibitors. So then we had to absolutely test this study. And that was the AHEF study in, in the 2000s where patients were being treated now with contemporary heart failure therapy, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and then were additionally given nit nitrate hydrase in combination or placebo. And you can see that all these patients in this study were African-American males. So this was a study done in black patients. And you could see that hydrazine isodyl combination further improved survival on top of contemporary good medical therapy. So hydrazine isodyl uh, <coughs> improves survival and uh, in particularly black patients and is considered a lifesaver, And but it is less effective than ACE inhibitors in non-black non -black patients. So it is a subgroup benefit. All right, so move into the 80s. And uh, we began to learn more about this neurohumoral activation. And we realized that there was the RAS system, 
the sympathetic nervous system, the aldosterone antagonists that were possibly helpful, and we'll get to the neprolysin. So what was the ACE inhibitor story? What the ACE inhibitors do is prevent the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which is the harmful substance, and therefore you don't have enough angiotensin 2 to cause the harm. So ACE inhibitors were studied in the late 80s, and the one of the pivotal trials was the SOLD trial, where enalapril was tested against placebo uh, in patients with systolic heart failure, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And the original study was the consensus study in class four heart failure patients, showed a dramatic benefit with ACE inhibitor therapy. The, there was a, over a 40% reduction in, in mortality within six months of using ACE inhibitor in heart class four heart failure patients. And the SOLVE trial, which used enalapril, was using it in, in less sick uh, heart failure patients and clearly showed a, a mortality benefit uh, with the use of ACE inhibitors. And when we looked at patients with low ejection fraction who did not have clinical congestive heart failure, they had no symptoms, but the left ventricle ejection fraction was low. In those cases as well, ACE inhibitor therapy improved survival and decreased the need for hospitalization for heart failure. So it is the systolic dysfunction that the ACE inhibitor helps. And also if there are symptoms and it improves the symptoms. So there were over 32 randomized clinical trials which showed a 23% reduction in all cause mortality and a 35% reduction in mortality or hospitalization. A very strong benefit clearly showing that ACE inhibitors are lifesavers in the management of heart failure. All right, well, next came along the beta blockers to address the pathophysiological abnormality of this activated sympathetic nervous system. <clears throat> the pivotal paper was the uh, Copernicus trial using carvedilol, and this showed a dramatic decrease in mortality compared to placebo. And the survival in carvedilol patients was much better using the beta blocker. And there was a decrease, not only in overall mortality, but a decrease in sudden death mortality, hopefully clearly showing the beneficial effects of the beta blocker in case of arrhythmias causing sudden death. So this brought on the era of use of beta blockers in heart failure, where there was systolic dysfunction. And until then, if you remember, we used to be taught that beta blockers are contraindicated in heart failure because they decrease contractility. Well, through the neurohumoral system, the benefits are much greater with the use of beta blockers. And um, not only do beta blockers decrease uh, overall mortality, they decrease death from worsening heart failure and sudden death, as I explained to you and metoprolol showed a similar benefit, and bisoprolol showed a similar benefit. So there are three beta blockers, which now are in the group of what we call lifesavers. And these improve mortality on top of patients already receiving ACE inhibitors or beta blockers. So we have a additional benefit of blocking the sympathetic nervous system on top of blocking the RAS system. All right, what about the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists? And, and this came in the 1990s. So these are the aldosterone antagonists such as paranolactone. And aldosterone is produced after the angiotensin II uh, goes onto the AT1 receptors and causes the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. And aldosterone causes salt and water retention and raises blood pressure and vasoconstriction. So if we were to antagonize aldosterone, if we use an aldosterone antagonist, a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, then we would diminish the harmful effects of aldosterone. And the first trial was the RILES trial uh, using spironolactone in patients with systolic heart failure. And this trial clearly showed improved mortality in patients with blocking the, the aldosterone. And hospitalization was also decreased 
by 36%. So clearly showing that it was highly beneficial. Not only was total mortality decreased, but again, sudden death was also decreased because of the effect of aldosterone on the sympathetic nervous system and the induction of arrhythmias. So the mineralocorticoid antagonists fell into the category of lifesavers. Um, first was uh, spironolactone, and then there was a more selective um, uh, aldosterone antagonist, aplerinon, which also showed benefit. And the newest kid on the block is phenerinone, and you are going to hear a lot more about it in the next few years, because that's most likely going to be the aldosterone antagonist of choice because it has been shown to be extremely beneficial when patients also have chronic renal disease or, or renal dysfunction at the same time, causes less hyperkalemia and has benefits uh, of decreasing cardiovascular events. All right, so what about the angiotensin receptor blockers? So you can block the uh, with the ACE, you can block the production of angiotensin II. With the uh, mineral corticoid antagonists, you can block the effect of aldosterone. With the angiotensin receptor blockers, you block the AT1 receptor, and so angiotensin II cannot do its harmful stuff. So again, we are working on the RAS system. And the, the big trials were the CHARM overall program using Kendasartin, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker. And it clearly showed <clears throat> against placebo that it improved uh, mortality and hospitalization for heart failure. The reason that we could test <clears throat> candesartin against placebo is because these were patients who were intolerant to ACE inhibitor. So this was a group of patients who could not get take ACE inhibitor and therefore were able to be given placebo versus candesartin, and we were able to show a 15% improvement in mortality and heart failure hospitalization. <clears throat> and when another uh, uh, tensin receptor valsartan was used in the Valiant trials, it showed a similar benefit to the ACE inhibitors. So we learned now that the ACE inhibitors were lifesavers, and so are the angiotensin receptor blockers, and their benefit is equal. So you can use either an ACE inhibitor or use an angiotensin receptor blocker. And the ones that have been best studied are valsartan and candesartan in, in, in heart failure situation. All right. At around the same time, in the early 2000s, we began to realize that despite excellent contemporary pharmacotherapy for our patients with heart failure, we were still having sudden death being a problem with our patients. So 50% of patients with severe heart failure die of sudden death, which is arrhythmic. So came the era of the use of devices and in patients with advanced heart failure, you needed to use a left ventricular support device, the left ventricular assist device, to see if you can bridge them to heart transplant or use it chronically to improve their quality of life with the chronic use of left ventricular assist device. So the first trial was in 2001 using the left ventricular assist device, which was the so-called rematch trial. And it used this uh, surgical technique with a battery powered pack that the patient wore on the outside. And since then, which was the original study, we have shown that better and better surgical techniques and better technology has now moved the survival of these patients who are, have severe advanced heart failure almost to the level of the survival of heart transplant patients. So this is an option as a bridge to transplant or in patients with advanced heart failure who, um, who uh, who are on full medical therapy, but still remain symptomatic. And I told you the problem of sudden cardiac death, despite excellent contemporary pharmacotherapy. And that brought the era of the implantable cardioverter defibrillator, which uh, is implanted 
similar to a pacemaker. And then if it senses ventricular fibrillation, it will give a shock and, re and, and uh, restore sinus rhythm. The, uh, the MEDIT trial clearly showed that survival was superior with the use of the ICD device compared to full contemporary medical therapy. So these patients with the defibrillator had contemporary medical therapy and had an implanted ICD device. The SCUD-HEF trial showed that it, the ICD device had lower mortality compared to contemporary medical therapy. And in this case, it was the use of amiodarone or placebo. And you can see that the ICD device clearly is, is, uh, is a game changer. So <clears throat> we learned again that patients who had heart failure and had left bundle branch block, there was dyssynchrony between the left and the right ventricle leading to inefficiency of cardiac output. So we looked at patients with left bundle branch block and heart failure and tried to resynchronize the ventricular contraction. So it has an atrial lead, it has a right ventricular lead, and it has a lead going through the coronary sinus at the back of the left ventricle and pacing the left ventricle and the right ventricle simultaneously. So you resynchronize the, the pacing. So this is called cardiac resynchronization therapy. And it showed that with this, uh, this uh, it, it compared to patients who were on contemporary pharmacotherapy, the implantation of the CRT device further improved survival. So now we know that the LVED device, the, the defibrillator, implantable defibrillator, or the CRT device by themselves, or the CRT device with a implantable defibrillator built into it, all are lifesavers on top of, of contemporary excellent medical therapy, but only in patients with severe systolic heart failure and when the ejection fraction is less than 35%. So these devices are used for those subgroup of patients who remain symptomatic and the ejection fraction remains below 35% despite excellent medical therapy. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to take you back into the two, uh, 2010 eras and, and the, we started to learn a little bit more about the naturetic peptide system and neprilysin. And this brought in the era of ERNI or ARNI, which is angiotensin receptor blocking and neprilysin inhibition at the same time. So now we are working on the pathophysiology that occurs in the naturetic peptide system. And I explained to you before that the naturetic atrial peptides do the opposite, do the good things as opposed to the bad stuff from the RAS. And you have excess neprolysin, which breaks down the naturetic peptides. And if you can inhibit the neprolysin, then you will have the benefits of the naturetic atrial peptides. So we wanted to test this in a randomized trial. So the drug is called Secubitril Valsartan. It's a combination tablet, which has Secubitril, which is a neprolysin inhibitor, and Valsartan angiotensin receptor blocker, both in the same tablet. The ARB goes and blocks the AT1 receptor like any other ARB, and then the Secubitril goes and blocks the neprolysin and enhances the positive benefits of the atrial naturetic peptides the, <clears throat> and, and allows vasodilatation and naturesis. And the bad stuff on the RAS is blocked with the ARB. So we are doing a combination here of blocking the RAS system and enhancing the naturetic uh, peptide system. So the, the, the pivotal trial was the paradigm trial where uh, patients were receiving uh, ACE inhibitor therapy and beta blocker therapy. So they were on contemporary um, uh, medical therapy for heart failure. And they were tested against a group of patients that were not given an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, but instead were given Secubitril Valsartan, <clears throat> which is ARNI, angiotensin receptor blocker, neprolysin inhibitor. Uh, 
and Tresto is the trade name, and clearly showed that the use of the Arni was superior to ACE inhibitor. So now for the first time, we have a new therapy that replaces an old therapy, which was already a lifesaver. But now we have a better lifesaver working on the RAS system and the, the, the uh, naturetic peptide system. So <clears throat> improve the primary endpoint, <clears throat> decreased cardiovascular death, and also decreased all-cause mortality. So the Arnies became lifesavers, which, <clears throat> which uh, uh, <clears throat> improve uh, heart failure mortality over and above uh, what ACE inhibitors can do or ARBs can do. So we have dropped digoxin. We know that hydralazine and isodil is useful in some subgroup of patients, the black patients with systolic heart failure and ARNI, which is far more effective than ACE inhibitor and ARB, now replaces them. And so you don't have to use an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, you use an ARNI and you get the same benefits of ACE and ARBs, but additional neprolysin inhibition, which further improves output, uh, uh, further improves mortality. And we know the devices are used in certain subgroup of patients. So I'm now just going to digress in this last uh, third of the presentation to, to something that fell in our laps. It was an absolutely fortuitous finding, and we did not know at all whether there was some role of the SGLT2 protein in the pathogenesis or in the pathophysiology of heart failure. We were testing the SGL2 inhibitors in diabetic patients to see if it improved blood glucose, dropped hemoglobin A1C, and therefore would be used as an anti-diabetic drug. And the way it works in the proximal tubule is that the SGLT2 allows the reabsorption of glucose from the proximal tubule back into the into the bloodstream. So there is no glucose excreted in the urine in normal patients. And the same occurs in diabetic patients, but the glucose load is so much that the SGLT2 tra transporter cannot reabsorb all the glucose back, but some of it goes out as glycosuria. So if you give a SGLT2 inhibitor, you prevent the reabsorption of glucose from the proximal tubule into the bloodstream and you get the glucose being excreted in the urine. And that's the reason it was used in diabetics. It would clear the glucose from the blood and excrete it in the urine by preventing its reabsorption in the proximal tubule. And it turned out that, yes, it did that, but it lowered the blood glucose only slightly and hemoglobin A1C was decreased slightly. But by that time, in 2008, the FDA had mandated that any new class of diabetic drugs before they were licensed and approved had to go through what was called cardiovascular outcome trials to show that the diabetic drug was not harmful for cardiovascular outcomes. Because in the traditional, uh, traditional diabetic drugs, there were many concerns about the increase in cardiovascular adverse events with the use of these anti-diabetic drugs. So the SGLT2 inhibitors had to go through these cardiovascular outcome trials to show that they were safe to use in diabetic patients and did not increase the output uh, or could it not decrease cardiovascular outcomes. So all the red are the SGLT2 inhibitor studies. And what we found in the one of the large initial study, the Empareg study, was that was a completely unexpected finding that compared to placebo in these diabetic patients, empaglifosin, which is a SGLT2 inhibitor, significantly decreased cardiovascular death, decreased total mortality, and decreased hospitalization for heart failure. So not only was it neutral or safe to use in diabetic patients, it actually decreased major cardiovascular events 
And therefore we began to realize that the SGLT2 inhibitors may have some benefit in patients by preventing heart failure. So these diabetic patients were not heart failure patients. Some did have heart failure, but the patients who did not have heart failure also, also started to show benefit. So it was preventing heart failure. So four major trials were done in the outcome trials in diabetic patients, and they all clearly showed uh, that whether in the overall population, there was a 30 some percent decrease in heart failure hospitalization and, and heart failure hospitalization death, about 25% decrease. But if you, <clears throat> this occurred in the overall population and it also occurred in the population who already had heart failure. So then we say maybe they have this benefit in heart failure management rather than just being an anti-diabetic drug. So we needed to test the SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure patients, whether they had diabetes or not. And so started the era of the SGLT2 inhibitors in 2019. We published the DAPIHF and the Emperor Reduce trial, patients with reduced ejection fraction and, and heart failure were treated with SGLT2 inhibitor versus placebo, and they received all the contemporary other medical therapy for heart failure. And it showed a remarkable improvement in cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure, depending on whichever SGL2 inhibitor you used. And <clears throat> it was beneficial similarly to what it was in the outcome trials. It, um, also decreased new onset diabetes. So we saw in the diabetic patients, SGLT2 inhibitors prevent heart failure. And in the heart failure patients, it prevents diabetes. It's an amazing cardiometabolic drug. And if it is used on top of an ARNI, there was additional benefit in these patients when they were already on ARNI, which we know is a very superior drug in the treatment of heart failure. And when Secubitril while certain was added with, to ARNI, the, then there was even further improvement in, in all the major heart endpoints of heart failure. So this SGLT2 inhibitors work very early. They work in black patients. They have a side effect profile, which is essentially similar to placebo and are very safe. And then we began to learn that there is not only SGLT2 inhibition, but we can do an SGLT1 inhibition. So now you inhibit the SGLT1 in the, in the proximal tubule. So you get additional glycosuria and prevent the absorption of glucose. And it also prevents the absorption of glucose in the GI tract and therefore brings down blood glucose even better. So it is a slightly better anti-diabetic drug. But what about heart failure? Well, <clears throat> the Soloist tri trial was the one which used sotaglifosin, which is a dual uh, SCLT blocker. And within a median follow-up of nine months, there was a statistically significant uh, improvement in these diabetic patients with regards to cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. And the biggest finding was that it not only worked in heart failure reduced ejection fraction, heart failure mildly reduced ejection fraction, but it worked in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And the, for the first time, we had a drug that showed significant benefit in heart failure preserved ejection fraction, so-called FPAF. And... <clears throat> This is in the data in, in mildly reduced ejection fraction, and this is the data in preserved ejection fraction. So this brought on the most recent trial uh, published. Uh, so this data was published in the spring of this year at the ACC, and this data, which I'm showing you, is now published recently in August, a month and a half ago, at the European Congress of Cardiology, where we're using an SGLT2 inhibitor essentially in patients who have HEFPEF, preserved ejection fraction, heart failure. And lo and behold, it showed significant benefit in cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization in these patients. And so now we have a situation with the SGLT2 inhibitors that they work in reduced ejection fraction heart failure, 
They work in the preserved ejection fraction heart failure and the SGLT2 and 1 combined inhibitor works across the spectrum of, of, of heart failure patients. We are awaiting the results of the DELIVER trial. Emperor Preserved used empaglifosin. DELIVER is going to use dapagliflozin, and that result should be coming out very shortly. We are beginning to hear rumors and trickling of the results already. So the SGLT2-1 inhibitors are lifesavers, and they work across the spectrum of heart failure from reduced to preserved ejection fraction. <clears throat> but when we look at the pathophysiology of heart failure, we cannot understand which part of the abnormal pathophysiology of heart failure do these drugs work. So now we have a drug that works amazingly well, decreases kidney outcomes, decreases cardiovascular outcomes, improves diabetes, has a placebo-like uh, safety profile, and is an extremely useful drug, once a day dosing, one dose for everybody, has no hemodynamic effects, so you don't have to worry about blood pressure or lowering heart rate or anything. And, and yet, we do not know exactly how it works in heart failure. There are many uh, you know, uh, uh, proposals and, and comments and, and studies looking at the, uh, the uh, pathophysiology and how they work, but we do not know that today. So I've taken you from 1785 to 2021, and I've shown you that digoxin is probably not a drug you want to use in your heart failure patients. Loop diuretics are still helpful, particularly in the presence of pulmonary edema or pulmonary congestion. We have learned that hydralazine and isodil are helpful in a certain subgroup of patients, particularly black patients who are symptomatic with systolic heart failure particularly if they cannot tolerate an ACE inhibitor, where ACE inhibitors don't work so well in heart failure, in black patients with heart failure. We know that uh, addressing the neurohumoral activation is extremely beneficial, whether you block the RAS system with ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker, or with a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, so-called allosterone antagonist, all give benefit but blocking the sympathetic nervous system is also extremely beneficial with the use of beta blockers and, and enhancing the nat naturetic peptide system by blocking their breakdown by in inhibiting neprolysin. The ARNIs are extremely beneficial drugs in the treatment of uh, heart failure. We know that devices are helpful in certain subgroup of patients who have severe systolic heart failure and ejection fraction less than 35%. And you can resynchronize the heart function if there is left bundle branch block. And you can insert a defibrillator at the same time with the same device, and it improves sudden death. And then we have a gift given to us of this SGLT2 inhibitors, which are being tested for the treatment of diabetes. And now we learn that they are excellent drugs to decrease adverse kidney outcomes and adverse cardiac outcomes very significantly. So the lifesavers in 2021 are the beta blockers, ARNI. If you cannot have, use ARNI or it's not available, you can use an ACE inhibitor or ARB. The uh, allosterone antagonists, and I have told you about the new one on the block, phenerenone, and the SGLT21 inhibitors that I gave you the story. The loop diuretics are still useful. When you have resistance to loop diuretics, use a high dose in patients with renal dysfunction and or add metalazone and be very careful about the electrolyte imbalances in that situation and try the, to get the patient off the metalazone as soon as you can uh, once diuresis has occurred. Thank you very much. Uh, I've taken you through a long journey on the management of heart failure, starting from explaining the pathophysiology, the potential therapeutic targets, and which medications are truly helpful and are useful as lifesavers in 2021. 